Let's talk about rondel daggers stabbing through armor and all the questions that have come up through the testing that I've done with Todd. Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiator, and if you haven't seen it yet, check out the video on Todd's channel where we test a rondel dagger on various types of material. Um, this is part of a series, it's the third video in a series where he shows the making of a rondel dagger from beginning to end, one that's actually in the Wallace collection and it's very, very closely based on that. And in the second part, he actually went to the Wallace collection and compared the daggers side by side with Toby Catpole. And in the final video with me, we stabbed stuff. Now, a number of surprises have come out of uh, that testing, and I tell you, I have been um, really, really eager for this to come out. I've been really excited because I knew that it would ruffle some feathers, surprise some people, shock some people, horrify some people uh, with some of the things that happened. So this isn't the Rondel Dagger in that video, incidentally. This is a Todd Cutler uh, Rondel Dagger, and obviously if you want to get a very uh, reasonably priced for the quality um, Rondel Dagger for yourself, check out the Todd Cutler line um, through uh, Todd's, well, Todd Cutler through Todd's website. So um, we were specifically testing a very high-end replica Rondel Dagger based on an exact one from the Wallace collection. Now there are a few curious features about that Rondel Dagger and we'll talk about that as we go through the video. Um, but the main headline here, the main thing that shocked us is what that Rondel Dagger achieved, what it did, what it stabbed through, okay? So we started out with meat, we moved to various types of uh, simulated fabric armor, layers of linen, um, then also with leather added to it. Then we stabbed some mail and we finally ended up stabbing some steel sheet. Now, before we go on, this video, if you haven't seen Todd's video yet, then this video now will contain spoilers, okay? So I don't want to ruin your enjoyment of Todd's video, so Pause this video, go over to open up another um, another tab, another window, and go and view Todd's video before you carry on with this one first, because this video is essentially, uh, this, uh, that Todd's video is the springboard for this video, okay? So the things I'm gonna be talking about in this video, you'll need to at least know what happened in Todd's video first. Right, so making sure you've hopefully now gone away, watched that and come back, or you've already seen it, so now let's talk about the findings in that video. So. The headline here is both Todd and I were really surprised by how easily, relatively speaking, the Rondel Dagger went through everything, as it turns out, okay? What did I expect? What did he expect? I can't speak for, for Todd, and um, also I don't want to um, talk about things here that may be a better suited for him to answer, but I'll talk about the bits that are maybe more aimed at me, questions that came up in the comments that are aimed at me. Um, I expected to stab through all of the fabric, no problem, but I didn't know what the depth of penetration would be. I did expect to stab through the mail based on my previous experiences of shooting and stabbing and throwing things at mail. Um, and we'll talk about the mail because there's some questions about quality of mail and types of mail and double mail and all this kind of stuff. We'll get to that in a second. Um, I expected to stab through the mail, but again, I didn't know what the depth of penetration would be. And I can guarantee you, I thought it would be way less than it actually was. No way on earth was I expecting to touch wood um, with Todd. <laughs> um, I was not expecting to go through that mail, through what was underneath it, and bury the point, maybe about a centimetre point, into his wooden table. Wasn't expecting that at all, okay? Um, and we went through it every time easily. No, there was not, you know, it didn't succeed, the mail didn't succeed any one time. Now lastly, the steel sheet. I think this is the one that really shocked everyone. And I can tell you, it did shock me, it did shock Todd, and it seems it shocked a lot of the viewers as well. What did I expect? I expected to go through the steel plate about that much, maybe a centimeter, half an inch, maybe at most an inch, because I have seen other things go through steel plates of comparable thickness, everything between one millimeter and one and a half millimeters, and this was 1.2 millimeter mild steel. Um, I expected to get a little bit of tip through it, so to speak, just the tip. Um, however, uh, as you saw, I got 
basically so much blade through that, I mean, let's be frank about it. Yes, it was, a, we'll talk more about the steel plate in a second. Yes, it was a flat sheet. Yes, it was mild steel. Yes, it was on a relatively solid surface, although actually it was on foam, so there was some give to it. Um, but that being said, the depth of penetration was vastly, vastly more than Todd or I expected, both stabbing and pushing. Again, I'll talk about stabbing versus pushing in a minute. Um, so it just blew our minds. And we, we, you know, we thought, yeah, we might compromise it in these favorable kind of setup that we've created, but we didn't expect to go through it to the degree that we did. And again, it's not an armor analog, and I'll come back to this point, but the fact is that if you're penetrating something by that much, that is way, way more than you need to be uh, lethal, okay? If we come way, way forward to the period of things like this Fairbairn Sykes dagger, okay, they considered, uh, both the Victorians and 20th century people in military combatives, whether it was World War I or World War II, basically considered that four or five inches into a torso, and certainly into a head or throat, is usually fatal, or very often fatal. If not immediately, then at some point. Let's be rather morbid for a second, um, and excuse me for that, but you know, just for reference, for anyone who hasn't really thought about it, this much blade, maybe seven, eight inches of blade, you're talking about an entire torso, or at least most of a torso, depending on the body size, and all of a limb, you know, right the way through a thigh, uh, unless you're a rugby player, maybe, uh, certainly all the way through a leg, all the way through a neck, this kind of thing, all the way through a head. That is a colossal amount of penetration, bearing in mind that it's going through a steel plate then a load of foam and into a wooden table underneath. Uh, that's just way more than we expected. So what are some of the points and questions that came up um, under Todd's video, some of which I've responded to directly on there actually in text, but I thought it'd be worth covering a video about this um, because there's a lot of interesting material to unpack there. So the first thing I really want to mention is that yes, absolutely, this steel plate in particular does not necessarily represent armor, but <laughs> here's the thing. So a lot of people will go, oh, it's a flat steel plate, it's braced on a table, uh, and it's 1.2 millimeter mild steel. Yes to all of those things. However, it's, it's an analog, it is something to test. Okay, first of all, what was real plate armor made of and how was it formed? First of all, yes, most plates on real plate armor were curved, and that makes a huge difference to actually getting any purchase with the tip of your weapon, okay? Because most things will slide off it. That's what it's designed to do. However, that being said, the fact is that there are, I am an armor wearer and an armor user. I own two harnesses and I have fought in one, uh, you know, to some degree. And the fact is that there are parts of any armor, even a late 15th century armor, there are parts of armor where things will get stuck. Parts where there are articulating lames, where the blade might slide to a certain point and then get stuck, or a rolled edge, for example, of where it comes around your armpit on a breastplate, so it might hit the middle of the breastplate, then slide and get stuck over here underneath the pauldron. Uh, secondly, there are some plates which are flatter than others. Certain bits, the upper breast can be relatively flat on some breastplates. Uh, coats of plates, if we go on brigandines, if we um, look at covered armors essentially, often things won't deflect off them because they are covered. So the simple fact is that you go into the covering, like the coat of plates or a corazina or a brigandine, and the, the point is not gonna slide off because it's already gone into fabric or leather over the top of it, so it's kind of stuck on that surface. So it's not gonna slide off very easily off that. Um, as I say, there are some plates which are flatter than others. There are certain, for example, pauldron plates, which can be relatively flat on the front, um, and so on and so forth. So. Yes, absolutely, usually things will glance off a steel plate. Um, but remember that you're primarily not aiming to stab through plates. You're primarily aiming to stab at the gaps in plates. And we know this because we've got loads of treatises. So usually you're aiming for the male parts. <laughs> male parts? The chain mail. Let's use the word chain mail. Uh, in an armpit, inside of an elbow, somewhere around the neck, collar, groin, back of the legs, this kind of thing. Okay, so you're usually aiming to stick the blade in a place where the plate isn't. However, this test showed that perhaps, maybe, sometimes if things go wrong, you might, with a particularly strong blow or a push, 
even be able to get a Rondel dagger through a plate. Now, let's talk about the material, 1.2 millimeter mild steel. As I mentioned in Todd's video, um, 1.2 millimeter is not especially thin um, for certain parts of medieval plate armor. Yes, indeed, the front of a breastplate or the front of a helmet or the top of a helmet might be up to three millimeters thick, okay, on a typical field harness. On jousting armor, the front of a jousting helmet can sometimes be close to a centimeter thick. It can be like eight millimeters thick, crazy, crazy thickness. But remember, that's a jousting helmet and it's only in one uh, specific spot. On a typical field harness, you might be looking at thicknesses throughout the harness, which vary between about 0.8 of a millimeter of steel, we'll talk about the material in a second, up to maybe three millimeters, okay? So, if we're talking about stab set, yes, you're very unlikely to go through the top of a helmet or the front of a breastplate. In most cases, that's just kind of fantasy. However, the people are covered in lots of armor of lesser thickness than that. And the fact is that oftentimes, leg armor, pauldrons, arm armor, the sides and backs of breastplates, the fold, which covers your abdomen and your crotch, these are going to be made of plates more like about one millimeter or maybe one to 1.2 millimeters pretty much exactly the same as we were testing okay so that's the first thing the second thing is material so we tested mild steel and a lot of people go oh well you wouldn't go through hardened uh, steel we'll see we'll test it remember we went through mild steel to that depth even if we go through tempered um, carbon steel to that depth, it's still worth knowing, it might not go through at all. But if we get through that much or that much or that much, it doesn't have to be as deep as the mild steel. It can still be at some point up here and still be very, very effective and still worth knowing. Okay, so we'll test that in the future, we don't know. But modern mild steel has mechanical advantages over it compared to all sorts of uh, metal, um, iron, ferrous metal, that was used in period armor. And the fact is, even in the 15th and 16th centuries, a lot of armor was made of iron, wrought iron, or with a little bit of carbon in it, the equivalent of mild steel. A lot of armor out on the field, maybe not the best armors, was made of the equivalent of mild steel. If a modern reenactor, living history person or HEMA person gets a helmet made out of mild steel, that is not an unhistorical helmet, it's perfectly historical. A lot of armor in period was made of the equivalent of mild steel. Not only that, their mild steel had a lot more flaws in it than our mild steel. Our mild steel is um, completely modern and homogenous steel without, without slag inclusions and this kind of stuff. So our mild steel is better than their equivalent mild steel, uh, pretty much universally. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up there on the plate armor, but lots of things to consider about penetration of plate armor, which I never expected to happen to a degree like that much through the plate. Just never expected that to happen. Now the next thing to talk about is the mail. The first accusation which I knew would come is, oh that's just uh, cheap Indian mail. Well first of all it's not really actually. This was riveted six millimeter uh, mail, uh, 14 gauge thickness, flat, alternating, riveted and um, solid. Okay, so yes indeed this was Indian commercially available mail. However, far from being the worst quality mail or anything like that. This mail is roughly equivalent probably to a lower to medium end quality mail of the period. Okay, and again, it's made of mild steel. A lot of mail made in period was wrought iron. Yes, you did in exceptional circumstances get steel mail and possibly even heat treated steel mail. This did possibly exist and I think it did exist according to the written sources, although we don't have any scientifically uh, modern surviving verifiable examples of it as far as I'm aware. Someone like Toby Capwell might collect me on, correct me on that or Augusto, I don't know, but I'm not aware of it. Mail that we know about predominantly is made of wrought iron or at best the equivalent of mild steel. So the material is correct. The rivets, Yes, I completely concede that the average modern mass-produced Indian mail, the rivet quality is not as good as a handmade mail by someone like Isaac Krog or someone else um, making, well, Nick Czech Checkfield or someone making modern, really good quality mail. Um, but that being said, in this test, and this is very important to note, in this test, not one single rivet failed. 
that we're aware of. So any questions about the rivet quality on this particular Indian male is completely moot because every single stab that I made on that male cut through the solid uh, ring. Okay, it cut through the either the solid ring or the riveted ring, but in no case did the rivet break. Not a single rivet was broken in this test. No rivets died here. Literally, it sheared through the metal. Now the metal is 14 gauge thickness, mild steel, which is completely historically valid. Okay, if anything, it's kind of better quality than probably the average male around at the time. So I don't accept questions in this particular situation of the quality of the male being, um, you know, being unhistorical or somehow invalidating the test, not at all. And also, as I said for the plate armor, bear in mind, we weren't just penetrating to here or here or here or here. We were penetrating with the entire blade until it was stopped by the wooden table underneath, okay? It just went completely through easily with practically no resistance, which boggles our minds. We were not expecting this. Yet again, Todd and I were not expecting this. We, I think certainly I was expecting to go through the mail. I was not expecting to go through it this easily with 50% force in my stab, the type of stab that you would easily be able to get on in any kind of sparring. Uh, actually quite a controlled stab, uh, certainly not stabbing as hard as I could have done, not putting my body weight behind it, I wasn't stepping, I was doing it from a stationary, non-stepping position, just dropping the arm with 50% of my strength, and it went through like butter really easily, practically no resistance. We were shocked, okay? Now this also brings us on to the question of, well, <laughs> Were there better quality males? Yes, 100%. Okay, so we know that in period there were some people who bought steel mail as opposed to iron. How did they define steel? We don't know. How did they know how much carbon was in the, in the material? In, uh, we don't know. My theory has always been that people knew something was steel by whether it was quenchable and hard, hardenable because if something has below a certain amount of carbon content and you try and quench harden it, it doesn't harden. So mild steel, you can't, you can't harden by quenching, okay? Um, however, at least not, not notably, um, whereas carbon steel, you quench it and it becomes much, much harder. So my opinion is that perhaps the, when we read about steel mail, this was actually heat treated in some cases, in which case 100% it would be much, much more difficult to get through. No question. So that brings us on to the question of double mail. Now, double mail is a problematic term and we don't necessarily know for certain that it literally means two layers of mail. It probably does, okay? So we actually find references to double mail and you've got to remember, of course, if people are wearing twice as much male on a given area, they're doubling the weight, doubling the thickness, doubling the, you know, in, 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 inconvenience, I guess, and the discomfort of wearing it. Why would they do that? Well, probably because single layer of male can be compromised by stuff. So if someone's going to the huge expense, weight and effort and everything else of wearing double male, that means that it's required. So that tells us something right there. But if we assume that double male was indeed two layers of mail as opposed to thicker mail made of double thickness wire or perhaps um, uh, linked six in one instead of four in one or perhaps with smaller holes so smaller diameter rings I think these are all possible and these are all things we know they did okay so mail was of varying thicknesses the wire varied in thickness the the size of the hole essentially the ring size varied how it was uh, interconnected, varied, and all of these things. So it's possible that double mail actually refers to one of those things, or it's possible that double mail refers to two layers. If we assume it's two layers of the type of mail we were testing, do I think that would make a big difference? Yes, 100%. Um, do I think it would stop the rondel dagger? I honestly don't know. We know that Pietro Monte, for example, talks about wearing double mail on the throat which makes perfect sense to me. I have a male um, standard or collar, and I am, uh, funnily enough, we know there are certain types of English male collar where they had little dags, as we could call them, triangles of male hanging down over the top of the principal male, which we could say is a form of double male. 
Do I think that I might be thinking about having double mail on my collar? Yes, now I am, uh, because obviously the neck is a very vital target and it's a small area. So if you double mail it here, you're not adding much weight, you're not add adding much cost. It's something I can do myself actually if I just buy the mail. Um, so yes, I might make a double thickness mail collar and it also also make the collar stiffer, which has certain advantages as well and helps protect the throat against um, impacts and stuff like this. But anyway, that's a subject for a future video. But Double mail, do I think I'd be able to stab through it? I don't know. Uh, do I think I'd be able to stab through better quality mail made, handmade by a good quality mail maker? I don't know. Send us some, we'll test it. Um, Todd and I would love to do future tests, I think. And so, you know, if you want to see us do these tests, then help make it possible. Uh, share his video around, you know, um, give it all of the usual um, thumbs up and that kind of stuff. Comment underneath for the algorithm. Uh, but, Absolutely, I, you know, I don't know, but based on the fact that we went through the mail to that depth, I think it's entirely possible that I can go through double mail, but it might be significantly more different, difficult. Or it's possible that the double mail might mean that you pop the first layer and you hit the second layer and the second layer stops you. I don't know. We'll literally, we'll, we won't know until we do it. Now to keep it brief, the last point I want to address about the armour specifically is a lot of, well, a few people said they would have liked to have see, uh, seen us test a gambeson underneath the mail. Now, the only point, I, I think, yes, we need to do that. Okay, 100% we need to do some type of padded armour underneath the mail and test that and see what happens. My personal belief is it will go through them uh, with a lot of penetration. I think we'll probably get maybe lose an inch of penetration, but given that we went through padded armour and we went through mail and we went through basically to the table in both cases, I suspect that when you add the two things together, yes, they will cumul uh, cumulatively and because the mail absorbs some of the force before it pops, might lose an inch or maybe two inches of penetration, but I still think we'll get a fatal depth of penetration through them. However, there's one point that I think is really important to make here, and it's, it actually relates to a common misconception, and that is that gambesons were always worn under mail. No. Okay, there was a period of history, let's say in the 12th and 13th centuries, when the standard armoured uh, get up for a knight was a gambeson and mail over the top. Sometimes mail with a gambeson over the top. We know they did it both ways and sometimes possibly with a gambeson, mail and then a gambeson. Uh, but yeah, th that was a period, the 12th, 13th century and the beginning of the 14th century is kind of when we see this as a thing. However, male armour worn for all of history before that and up until around the time of the Battle of Hastings and into probably the First Crusade and into the beginning of the 12th century, they didn't wear gambesons underneath. Gambesons weren't invented. Yes, the Romans had something which is known as a subamalis, which is probably akin to the late medieval arming doublet. That is, it is there to prevent chafing. It probably doesn't provide any real armour, certain maybe against slashing, but not against penetration of any note. Okay, so the fact is that whether it was Romans, whether it was Vikings and Anglo-Saxons, all the way up to Normans, um, Norman era in the 11th century weren't wearing gambesons under mail. They were just wearing mail. Okay, they were wearing clothing under mail, but they weren't wearing something like a big padded gambeson under mail. Now, if we fast forward to the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, again, gambesons weren't worn under plate armor because it's not practical. You overheat, it absorbs too much uh, um, liquid from your body sweat, uh, and additionally it means it, it, the armour can't function properly. So if you look at 14th, certainly late 14th century, go back into the 14th century, there's a gradual change, but by the time we get to the end of the 14th century, what we're wearing underneath um, underneath plate armour is not really what you would think of as a gambeson. It doesn't have a lot of padding and it doesn't have an awful lot of layers because that can't function under plate armour. And by the time we get to the middle of the 15th century, the standard garment worn underneath armour, plate armour, is a arming doublet. Now I own a very good replica myself and I, in fact I've got two, uh, three actually thinking about it, but one of them doesn't fit me very well, so only two that I wear and I know plenty of other people have got ones as well, they do not provide any notable level of stab resistance. They are only equivalent to the very first fabric layer that I stabbed through in this video all the way to the table without even feeling any resistance whatsoever. So, given that with plate, we're looking at stabbing mail when it's in the armpits or the inside of the arms, back of the legs, this kind of thing, or even around the neck if you've still got an aventail, then what you're really looking at is not very much fabric 
certainly not very much padding and not many layers underneath the mail. So you're going through the mail, you're going through three layers of linen, maybe some silk, um, and then you're into the body, okay? So, yes, 100% for the 12th and 13th centuries, we need to test gambeson under mail. However, by the time you get into the plate armor era, you don't really have gambesons underneath the plate armor. You have an arming doublet, and an arming doublet is really just like a jacket. It's not much at all. Now, one question came up about technique, push versus stab. A couple of people felt that uh, leaning on the dagger, pushing like this, or doing as Todd did, which was... <laughs> a little bit precarious <laughs> uh, right at the end of the dagger because obviously if that tip slides you've got no control over it whatsoever but the more conventional way is to hold keep holding the grip because you're using the dagger like this anyway and all you do is just momentarily in the moment bring your hand up to the back of there and you can maybe put your breastplate or chest behind it and push as well um, push versus stab some people felt that the push was more effective than the stab there's a very simple reason for that a stab has uh, velocity and when it enters the thing that it's hitting, it slows down, slows down, slows down and stops. The difference with a push is it's a sustained energy with your mass behind it. So it's got very little velocity. In fact, no velocity. It starts with in contact with the target. And literally all you're doing is you're dumping your mass on the end of the thing. Sometimes your strength if you haven't got your mass fully behind it. Um, and then that's providing a continued force. Now you'll notice from a rondel dagger shape, this is not a great example because this actually has a step here. So in most cases, this might penetrate to that depth and stop there. But assuming we didn't have this step here, this blade is just going to penetrate all the way down there until it's got something solid to stop against or a wooden table the other side. So... Yeah, um, in some cases a push can be more effective than a stab, but here's the thing. In most combat situations, you don't, unless you're wrestling on the ground, so in ground fighting indeed, you might be wrestling around in here and manage to lodge your point in somewhere in, a, in an armpit or a neck or whatever, and at that point you can climb on top of the dagger and apply force. So it's more situational. In a standing up fight, remember most of the time you're going to be just trying to find gaps, find holes, and the person's going to be flailing their arms or weapons around in ways that are preventing you from doing it. So most of the time when you hit the opponent, it's actually going to be in movement. So it's going to be as a stab. So that's why I think that for the testing, in some ways the stab is more important than the push. The push is also very fun to find out about and is certainly something that happens in combat. But most blows in history that happen with a rondel dagger on another opponent, especially an opponent in armour, are going to be blows, they're going to be stabs rather than pushes. Right, so to finish up, two points about that particular rondel dagger, uh, which are points rather, that, uh, rather than Todd to answer, which there are a bunch of points I'll leave him to answer. There are two points which came up specifically aimed at me about that rondel dagger. One was blade length, okay? So some people said, why is the blade so long? Now the simple answer is, I actually wouldn't want a blade quite that long. It's a little bit too long for me. So I mentioned in the video that the usual way people measure a rondel dagger is down to the elbow. Now we'll notice this one I've got here is actually beyond my elbow, okay? Um, now, there are all sorts of reasons why we use that proportion to measure with. Part of it is to do with protecting. So there are techniques, for example, in Fury, where someone actually swings something at your head and you put this in the way in a bar. Now, don't necessarily, as a bar, as a, as a blocking bar, don't necessarily think about unarmored, like wearing a T-shirt like I am right now. Think about more like you're wearing half armor, you're wearing, you know, typical... Uh, foot soldiers clothing so you might be wearing a brigandine and, and um, long-sleeved mail shirt or something like this or it might be civilian but in any case someone swings something at you and rather than just blocking it with your arm um, or you know you don't have a sword in hand you manage to get your dagger out quickly it's just putting a bar in place to enable you to then get in close to deploy your dagger at close range this kind of thing so closing distance um, so there's all sorts of situations why you might want to do that Equally, there's a question of proportions here. So if we're in a wrestling situation, if the blade was as long as a sword, for example, it would be very unwieldy in a wrestling situation. Um, now, clearly, a lot of people would say, why not have something more like this length in a wrestling situation? And clearly in World War II, this kind of, or in Shanghai in the 1920s, this kind of blade length worked very, very well. And I would say in most modern contexts, a blade this long or even shorter than this works very well. Um, however, 
there are a couple of advantages there are a few advantages to having a blade longer okay um, and one of those is that you it's more difficult to block okay because any type of block or opposition that comes in against the arm the hand the hilt the base of the dagger whatever the point you notice it's the point can still reach you okay so when you've got a blade over a certain length even though that blade might become unwieldy and yes indeed I've got to say I found the specific example used in the video, uh, in other words, the Wallace collection video, a little bit too long for me, okay? It projected quite a bit beyond my elbow, and I felt it quite difficult to steer the point. And indeed, with a blade that long, you get more flex in the blade, so actually you get less energy going into the target. A shorter, stiffer blade, theoretically, would go through even better than that one did. But anyway, um, I found with that blade a little bit unwieldy, and I prefer a shorter length, but I wouldn't want it to be too short. Like, I wouldn't want it to be as short as a Fairbairn Sykes, because in this context, people are attacking with swords it's not like world war ii people are attacking you with swords and pole axes and things like this a certain amount of blade length gives you more to work with more to hook with more to parry with in whichever way you're going to do it um, so it's better defensively and it's better offensively because you can reach past people's weapons and blocks and things like this and still hope to hit them uh, in the face with that point even if they're throwing their arm up in armor, out of armor, whatever, or throwing up a stick or um, the shaft of a pole axe or whatever to block you, there's still a chance you can get this past and still hit them. That's the first thing. The second thing that's, I and mean, there are other points, but these are the main two points, is that these daggers are very often in the treatises used like this or like this okay so they're often what we call half sworded with and they are gripped or supported such that they're used as a two-handed thing to block with and you still want to be able to do stabbing with them so you need a certain amount of blade length and you couldn't do these techniques with a little blade that's because your hand would cover almost the entire blade okay so quite simply these big blades fit very much with the fighting style and the fighting context of the time. And so the last, the final point is to do with that handle orientation. Now, I didn't know about that until I actually turned up to do the filming with Todd and he pointed it out to me and I was like, wow, that's really weird. Are you sure that's right? Um, because I never really thought about it. The main reason is that Rondel daggers usually have more or less cylindrical, sometimes they're hexagonal, octagonal, or even rectangular grips, but they don't usually have an orientation. Now, my experience pulling my rondel dagger out in armour is that very often you cannot orientate the edge in any particular direction um, because you can't feel it in your hand and your gauntlet is tanned and you can't usually look down and notice that the rondel daggers give you no guide whatsoever. With something like uh, a typical dagger or knife you have a cross guard and even without looking at it you know where the flats and the edge are because you can feel the cross guard. It's one of the advantages of cross guards. As soon as you have and we could potentially relate this to certain Asian swords as well, but again, topic for a future video. As soon as you have a cylindrical or round, rounded guard, you can't feel without looking at it which direction the edge is in, unless you have a grip that tells you. So in this case, the Wallace Collection dagger does tell you. Now, why would it have you holding the dagger flat rather than edge on? I don't know is the basic answer. But I do have some thoughts on this. The first thing is that which direction the edge is pointing in might not be even remotely important with a rondel dagger, and I don't really think it is over, uh, overall. You're not, for the most part, cutting with this blade. And in the techniques where a cut is used, you're wrestling on the ground and you're using it purely to cut through a strap on someone's armor. You're using a draw cut now, or push cut maybe. In this situation, you can actually feel against the object you're trying to cut because you can feel when the edge is pushing against it or when it's not pushing against it and you're basically just soaring. So you, it's not like you're cutting or slashing with this type of dagger. Um, so that's one thing. On one hand, it, it maybe doesn't matter which direction the edge is pointing in. But why specifically might the Wallace Collection dagger want you to have the blade flat on like this rather than edge on? So one thing that I think makes it contrary to what I would have expected is the flex when you stab. Now, if you watch Todd's video, you probably noticed this anyway. When I stab the steel plate, the blade flexes. We didn't know this, well, certainly I didn't. I didn't know, feel, or see this at all when I was doing it, but in the slowed down, in the slow-mo version, the blade flexes slightly. Now, 
Interestingly, the blade flexes because I'm stabbing this way. So my energy is between here, okay? So the blade, when it hits the target, flexes in this plane because it's got the flats here. If the blade was this way around, I believe I would get slightly greater penetration because it wouldn't be able to flex in the plane where the energy is going. It might flex from side to side, possibly, but because most of the force is between here, if you imagine in a triangle, actually when I hit the target, it wouldn't be able to flex, or at least not visibly, in the planes of the edge. When we have it flat on like that, it does flex, and therefore energy is lost from penetrating the target. Why would you want that? Well, I don't think you would want that either. My instinct is that you'd actually want the edges pointing in the direction of the thing you're stabbing, or possibly, you know, with the edge pointing towards you so that if you hook around on a person's arm or neck or whatever, you've got a shearing uh, drawing cut potential behind someone's leg, you know, going for their hamstrings. So I think it would be better this way around potentially. So I, I don't know. The only thing I can think about from a stabbing point of view is that from certain angles stabbing into a body, assuming you actually go into the body, um, then having a flat blade is sometimes advantageous. If we're going down behind the collarbone, down into the heart and into the chest cavity, if we're stabbing straight uh, between the ribs, and we actually know about this with World War II um, training manuals that often the thumb is placed in line with the flat, sometimes on the flat. If we look at the um, certain forms of combat knife, they actually have a placer on the, on the, on the blade. And you could say that uh, left-hand daggers used with rapiers do as well. That, that's for a different reason, usually that's for defending. But um, in some cases, these stabs are given this way uh, with the flat facing you or facing away from you, the flats. Um, so that they will penetrate the body more easily and are less likely to get bound up or stuck on bone. So that's one possible idea. Uh, the other possible idea going back to the flex thing is that possibly it's to do with shock absorbency. Perhaps they were finding that with daggers with the edge on this way because there was nowhere for the blade to flex in this direction, given that they were using medieval steel with more uh, inclusions and stuff and imperfections, perhaps sometimes the blades were more likely to snap, whereas if they were allowed to flex slightly this way and absorb some of the shock a little bit more effectively that way, maybe they didn't. I don't know. These are all, I'm just spitballing ideas here. So there are my thoughts that I absolutely love doing this testing with Todd and thanks to Todd for uh, thinking it up and calling me over and all of that kind of stuff. Hopefully we'll do more similar tests in the future, probably we'll do more with Ronald Daggers. Um, but check out his video, hopefully you've already watched it by the point you've got to this in mind. I hope my further thoughts have been interesting. If you have further questions, thoughts, ideas about this whole matter, feel free to post below because I'm always happy to entertain new ideas, new things I haven't thought of, and indeed answer new questions that I maybe haven't addressed in previous videos. Thanks for watching, give us a like and a subscribe if you haven't done already, and I will see you back on the channel really soon. I have been Matt Easton, and I will be next time as well. See you soon, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.